on Larry King Now, Garrett Hudland. We shot 450 pages in about 10 weeks. But that's Soderbergh. I mean, he shoots fast, he shoots everything himself, and that's why it'd be a misfortune to, to Hollywood and the film industry if he had retired. You grew up on a cattle farm in Minnesota? I did, yes. I was driving the pickup when I was eight to drop my dad off at the tractor. Did they expect you to take over the farm one day? Oh, yes. Between Mosaic, mud, pretty much everything has been somebody with like a little bit of internal conflict or struggle. And it's not only for my mom, my sister, my aunt June, my manager, my publicist, and all my friends, they say, will you please just do a comedy? Plus, if I was able to do something like once or twice a year, that I could still sort of hide under the radar while learning as much as I could, then eventually I'd be ready to, to speak about my passions. So now I'm reaching the 10,000 hours. All next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Our special guest is actor Garrett Hedlund, known for his memorable performances in films like Tron, Legacy, Unbroken, Inside Llewellyn Davis, On the Road, Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, and of course, Country Strong. Garrett has charted a diverse career in Hollywood, recently starred in the award-winning D. Rees film, Mudbound, and his latest work is in Mosaic, a first-of-its-kind project from Steven Soderbergh and HBO. Thanks for coming, Garrett. My pleasure. What is Mosaic? It's an app? It's, it started, it was intended to be an app. An app where you just watch it as an app. Where you watch it and you get to choose whose storyline you care to choose. And you can go throughout that. And then I think HBO had seen it and they thought it would be a wonderful idea to put it out as a linear version for HBO, which is, I think, going to come at the end of January. Is it a mystery? It's a mystery. You it takes play. place in a, I, I play a young guy who's kind of, under the microscope, because it is a mystery, there's a lot of suspects, and I play one of the suspects. Now, when you shot it, you just shot it like doing a movie, right? We shot... Or do you do it differently because it's going to be an app? We shot 450 pages in about 10 weeks. So... But that's Soderbergh. I mean, he, he shoots fast, he shoots everything himself, and that's why it'd be a misfortune to, to Hollywood and the film industry if he had retired. So, What's he like to work for? His Different. sense of humor is is uh, the the best I've ever worked with. Um, his intelligence, his his ability to tell stories and creative stories that have never been done before, is immaculate, and he's just one of my favorite people. What about the idea of telling stories in a non-linear fashion? You're gonna see a lot more of that. I suppose so. After people see this, I think it's going to be some quite common. It's just it's so unique and it's so fun. And I've enjoyed kind of going through it and seeing because we only had our storyline. And so we only knew what our characters knew. So there so were a lot of characters. There were a lot of characters that didn't know who the other characters were. And so it was very interesting. And I actually I really preferred that because when people talk about like how Clint Eastwood shoots and stuff like that, one or two takes and very fast and you don't have the time to second guess a lot of the things that you would normally second guess or try and, you know, kind of dwell upon. You just kind of, you go in with your instincts and those are what get to be in the finished product and that was very fun for me to experience for the first time. Sharon Stone is the star, right? Yeah. She's terrific. Actually. She's fantastic, and she's wonderful in this, and I think that when people see this, that they're going to be, they're, she's going to blow them away. Okay, you're also in a movie everybody's talking about. I haven't seen it yet, Mudbound. Critics are calling it the best film of the year. It was not a, ma it's not a major studio, is it? It wasn't a major studio. We shot it for maybe roughly around 12 million in New Orleans. Um, very sort of, uh, very small shoot. Uh, and then Netflix picked it up out of Sundance. Now this is a very intriguing I, movie. <laughs> a black female director, a female cinematographer, both rarities. How did you like working with them? They're true artists. It was such an honor to work with. It, see, I'd, I'd seen Pariah, I'd seen Bessie, and what Dee had done with that was just extraordinary. 
her ability to tell a story of somebody in a, in a situation that's kind of going through either an identity crisis or an internal conflict within where they are and not knowing how to voice her and not knowing how to sort of uh, navigate their way through life, she will hold on their faces while they're going through this dilemma right in front of you and, and literally for like two or three minute takes. And when I'd seen Pariah, I said, man, I would like somebody to chart my roller coaster of conflict and, and struggle. And that's exactly, you know, this story is very particular because this one in general takes place post-World War II right after uh, it's dealing with a sharecropper era, which you don't really see because normally what we've seen in cinema has gone from slavery to civil rights. And so it's a particular area that, you know, it, it deals with two families that have come together under a horrible circumstance of brutal social hierarchy, but are forced to kind of deal with each other because of sharecropping. And was it a tough shoot? It was a tough shoot because of a lot of the scenes we had to deal with, a lot of the, uh, you know, the bigotry and stuff like that. Plus, we were dealing with tornadoes, uh, a lot of rainstorms where we had to film in the rain when it wasn't intended to be rain. Um, we would get warnings to go hide in elementary school because a tornado was just coming. Um, Huh. And also, there's there's scenes, and I don't want to give anything away, but when you get to the end of this, there's scenes with me and Jason Mitchell that become very hard for people to experience. It was hard for us to shoot, but I think it, it allowed us to form more of a, a bond than anything else because we knew how sensitive this subject matter was and how hard it was for the crew to deal with and us to deal with, so that's what made it a hard Think he's gonna win a lot, award? Oh, I don't know, he always, I just, I'm so proud of, of Dee. She um, assembled an amazing cast, an amazing crew on this. And like you said, with the thing with Dee is she assembled a crew that was primarily female. And now I get a lot of questions, how is that to work with? I'm like, it doesn't matter, they're, they're passionate, they're artists, they're geniuses, and I felt more honored than anything. And also, I've been on a lot of shoots where we shot this in 29 days. I've shot, you know, films that were seven to nine months long, and I'm not sitting here with you. Mr. <laughs> so it's it, they were very efficient, and they're all. Um, I think they're all going to get the accolades they uh, deserve. Our guest is actor Garrett Hedlund. We're talking uh, farming and fame after the break. Stay with us. Our guest is Garrett Hedlund. He stars alongside Sharon Stone in Mosaic. He's also one of the stars of Mudbound, a movie that is getting a lot of attention. You grew up on a cattle farm in Minnesota? I did, yes. Did what kind of cattle? I'm feeling like I'm from Brooklyn, New York. You know, what kind of cattle? It was beef cattle, beef cattle. And I always get everybody says, you grew up in the Midwest, Minnesota, were you a dairy farmer, were you this? And I thank God so much that I wasn't because uh, the, what they have to go through is, is the four in the morning, you know, everyday milking. What we had to do was, you know, we'd wake up at 6.30 in the morning and we'd do calf hen and um, obviously be in the tractor all day, every day. I was driving the pickup when I was eight to drop my dad off at the tractor. I was driving uh, the tractor and the cultivator by the time I was 10. Did they expect you to take over the farm one day? Oh, yes. I grew up on the farm with three channels, so I got to watch like every Roseanne, <laughs> Cheers, stuff like that, but we had one theater that played one movie uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday in town. And I never got to go because my father said, well, that's 25 miles to town. That's 50 miles round trip. Now, why the heck am I going to spend 50 miles in gas money for you to go see a movie? Plus, I'm going to have to pay for popcorn, soda, and everything for the three of you. <laughs> so when, we were working with, when I was working with Peter, I'd said, how... How can I possibly, with all the films that are coming out now, and Brian Cox had given me the ruling class that Peter had done, 
and I was so inspired by that. I said, how can I keep up with all the films from back then, plus be able to watch everything that's coming out presently to sort of seek the inspiration and everything that I desire? And Peter goes, well, that's the benefit of DVDs now, my boy. If you care to watch it, you can. And that's why when people ask about Netflix, I'm like, they're given the biggest benefit out of anything. If I would have had Netflix grown up as a kid, I would have been... First off, I probably never would have left because I would have been such a movie buff that <laughs> I just would have hung home every day and, and you know, watched these films. But it's the benefit that, that they're given. Not everybody has a video store, not everybody has a theater, and that's why I'm so proud to have something like Mudbound be able to be widely distributed through this Netflix of sight for anybody all over the world to see and not just see but as many times as they want. You said you were worried about selling your soul in Hollywood? No, it was because a lot of, I remember after the first three films I did, I did one film a year for the first three years but on paper it looked like I was working non-stop. But I would do a film for four months and then they would say, um, you've been offered this film or this film but it just wasn't anything that I felt was going to be emotionally impactful, emotionally like where I was going to grow, where I was going to learn. It just wouldn't have been something that I was going to be proud of and that I would have been able to stretch and reach you, for. You didn't want to be a star? star? I did, because I didn't think I was ready for anything. I just wanted to, if I was able to do something like once or twice a year that I could still sort of hide under the radar while learning as much as I could, then eventually I'd be ready to to speak about my passions, to give an interview, to do something. I think finally after like 10, 12 years or so, you know, the 10 hour, uh, 10,000 hours thing. Okay, <laughs> you can finally, you finally yeah. have enough wisdom to do when it's been that much. So now I'm reaching the 10,000 hours. But you sing so well, and in Country Strong you were amazing. It was fun. Is that part of your life too? Do you, do you, do you sing in public? Um, <clears throat> yeah. I, when we were researching for Country Strong, I was so scared about, because I, we started shooting January 2010. Um, I started learning how to play the guitar August 2009. So this guy, Neil Cassell, who was the lead guitarist for Ryan Adams and the Cardinal, would come over four or five days a week and we'd rehearse the guitar. And it would, you're starting off, with, well, at first it took me two weeks to even be able to sing and play at the same time. And it, it was very tricky and I, I knew that I would have the scenes handled. I was scared about the live performances and then I moved to Nashville maybe a month and a half before we started shooting and stayed at uh, Tim McGraw's cabin outside of Franklin. Um, and Tim would, would sort of, I'd go into the studio with Tim. Uh, there was a great guitar coach out there, Rob Jackson. I'd go to him every day, and then I'd go to the studio to chart the progress of how the songs were coming along so they can send to Randall Poster, who's an amazing um, music supervisor for Wes Anderson and, and Scorsese. And, and so was the, there was a lot of pressure within some of this, but I just kept having that schedule until we started filming and I found out I was enjoying performing more than I wanted to be a part of these scenes <laughs> to an extent. <laughs> You've had quite a life. Think about it. You know. yeah. yeah, you touched a lot of bases. <laughs> Up next, we're going to talk <laughs> about weird jobs and weirder fan encounters and the film Garrett would have loved to star in. More with Garrett Hedlund right after the break. We're back with Garrett Hedlund. His uh, recently starred in uh, Mudbound, which is being heralded for an Academy Award. His latest work is Mosaic, a first-of-its-kind project Steven Soderbergh directed. It. Okay, we play a little game called If You Only Knew. They're just like, like a quiz. Who was your childhood celebrity crush? Um, I think... Uh... Reese Witherspoon when she did the film Man on the Moon and then mm -hmm. it turned into uh, geez, 
just um, Diane Keaton. Not bad. Secret talent. <laughs> Secret talent. Secret talent. Uh, I can. Was that a bird? I hope it sounds like a bird <laughs> because that's the only secret talent I have. <laughs> well, <laughs> you out on the farm, you thought of things like No, we have different things. I mean, the other secret talent I have was the other day, because I just came back from vacation in Cayman, in Cayman Islands, and I became everybody's manny. So maybe that could be the side of it. All my friends now have a lot of kids, I have none. So I was everybody's manny. But um, most of them are all daughters, and I was able to give most of them all a French braid, which <laughs> I grew up on the farm because I didn't know even where to buy a jump rope, so my grandpa taught me how to braid twine string, then braid three of them together to make the jump ropes so we could train for wrestling. So you could braid hair? I braid hair. What's the I got other talents, too. <laughs> okay. What's the weirdest job you've ever had? The first job, worked on a turkey farm. That was the first check I ever got. Um, I did McDonald's when I was 14. I worked uh, right before I moved to Los Angeles. I worked for a Christmas tree stand where I worked sold from. Sold Christmas trees? Yes. Oh, I was also, uh, I sold coupon books door to door. You're an interesting guy, Garrett. Um, well, who would you trade places with for a day? I doubt you trade places with anyone for a day. I trade places with you for a day. Okay. I've seen all the photos around this whole office, and it's everybody I admire has sat down with you. Well, I'd, I'd be happy if you want to come in here next week and do it. Uh, is there a film you most wish you could have starred in? Now that you got so involved with movies and you're watching DVDs and you're learning about film? Say HUD. HUD. HUD, yeah. HUD, Cool Hand Luke, any of those. Big Paul Newman fan. I knew him very well. He was an amazing guy. Did you ever race with him? No, but I, when he would do interviews, I interviewed him three or four times, he would bring a six pack of beer. And on every break, drink beer. Is there something you wish you were better at? Thanks for my Earl Grey. <laughs> something uh, you wish you were better at? I was better at. I'm getting better at dancing. That's good. Wish I was better at um, flying. I want to have uh, my pilot's license by now. I have eight hours. That's all eight hours? <laughs> it's like three sessions. But you want to fly? Yeah, yeah. You were always very good with those questions. Most people just answer them quick, but you get involved. You get really serious about this I, sh I should I should you're a serious guy Garrett I should Say learn it. a little more about that but you were a cat you books. were a class clown as a kid yes you were funny I try to be sometimes have you ever done a comedy it breaks the eyes on, on certain tensions no that's what everybody's yelling at me for they're like because between mosaic mud pretty much everything has been somebody with like a little bit of internal conflict or struggle and it's not only for my mom my sister my aunt june my manager my publicist and all my friends they say will you please just do a comedy because we can't deal with you and all these <laughs> all these film schedules garrett will answer your social media questions in our final segment plus a word on the tron sequel we'll be right back in our final segment we have questions from uh from out there, and the, out in the hinterlands. Marcel Aquan, you've worked with directors like Ang Lee, Wolfgang Peterson, John Wright, the Cone Brothers, and Angelina Jolie. Joe Wright. Who is your favorite? Or is that impossible to say? Man, this is just, I'm gonna get myself in trouble with this mm. one. I've learned uh, amazing things. The reason I loved working with Wolfgang so much was because I never, I never knew how to be on a film set. I, you know, I'd, uh, like I'd said, I'd, I'd done some classes, but first and foremost, to learn how I felt I was trying to learn acting was I would go online to a place, uh, to a website called Joe's Script, Drew's Scriptorama, and I would read scripts to movies that I hadn't seen before because I, 
I'd heard that like five easy pieces was amazing. So I'd go on, I'd, I hadn't seen it first, and I'd read the script, and I'd read like the chicken between your knees scene or something like that, and I'd try and rehearse it for a week, and then I'd watch it to see what the guy that got the film did. Not to show you how to replicate, but how to show you that there's no rules and you're not cuffed mm -hmm. to anything. And so if I thought something was to be elevated and, and Jack just made it minimal, that taught me that there are no rules. What movie did you make with Wolfgang? Uh, that was Troy. Um, I hadn't been on a set before when they said, uh, you're doing off-camera work, just stand right here next to the camera. I said, but I'm in this scene. Why, why should I stand off the camera? And so it was, it was still like I brought back to like asking about what actors eat. You know, the naivety <laughs> around then wasn't non-existent. <laughs> Um, for Ang Lee, it was somebody that was very, um, very passionate, insanely sensitive, um, and so aware of what he wanted. I mean, I was on set in Atlanta two months before we started shooting. We would rehearse a lot of these big scenes day after day, and he would be there. Like, it, it, he, he was pretending to be Destiny's Child when we didn't have Destiny's Child there. And he's like, and then Beyonce goes, and then we do this, and the fireworks go like this. And I was like, man, this guy is, he's so insanely aware of what he wants and what he's going to do visually. And then working with Joe Wright was, I'd never, I haven't been involved in many plays. And Joe Wright rehearses like it's like it's theater, like it's a play, because that was kind of his background. His father um, orchestrated uh, children, like puppeteer and uh, like puppet shows for kids, and was very famous for that. And so Joe Joe's always had this like childhood sensibility where he wants to have fun, he wants to be entertained, and he wants to enjoy what he's watching, and he loves to laugh. And so this becomes infectious. So I've learned so much from all of them, long story short. So. Yeah, because we've got to get through some other questions. Yeah. <laughs> Handle every director. Maxi Cat, have you ever considered releasing more music? Um, yes. Why don't yeah. you? It's, um, when somebody approached me after we did Country Strong, they wanted a Simon, and, and I said, what would this entail? And they said, well, we'll go to the studio, or we'll go to the label, and we'll get songs sent in. We'll get 20 songs sent in. You'll choose your favorite 10, and then we'll go that way. But then you're under, you know, it's like acting, and especially the, a lot of the characters I've done has been hard enough, but to fly around and sort of also be there by yourself, kind of getting up on stage, but also not singing your song. It just wasn't something at that time that I thought was, I was like, my mind was in like, I just started writing all my own songs. And so I didn't want to choose 10 of the best 20, but I hadn't had 10 yet that I wrote. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so I get I'll it. find an outlet and I'll find a way. And a lot of our friends, we want to collaborate a lot, so it will be an eventual thing. I think we've run out of time. We didn't have time to get all the questions, but I must ask you, tell me about the movie Burden. It's another tricky one. I did it and tricky only because Mudbound deals a lot with a racial divide. Um, there's a lot of strenuous scenes in Burden, and I didn't want to do another hard film, like you said, about doing a comedy. I just wanted to do a comedy after Mudbound. And I flew to Italy to do a motorcycle journey of the Southern Alps, the Dolomites. And I hadn't been on a motorcycle in six years, so I'm scared shitless. <laughs> and they approached me with doing this film, Burden. And it would be where I play a guy named Mike Burden in 1996 that started the first KKK memorabilia shop in Lawrence, South Carolina. And and to not give much away, there's a, he falls in love, and really, most importantly, it's you know it's a very particular love story centered around him being involved with the KKK and having to make a choice between love and his affiliation. Gary, yeah, you have great talent. You're an, you're you're an enormous talent. 
Do a comedy. Do a comedy, Garrett. I will. Thank you so much. A great guest. My pleasure. Always an honor. Thanks to my guest, Garrett Hedlund. The Mosaic app is available on Android and iPhone, and the miniseries premieres January 22nd on HBO. Mudbound is available on Netflix and in select theaters nationwide. You can always find me on Twitter at King's Things, and I'll see you next time.